It is a story about a magical sword, the battle to possess it, and the man entrusted with it. Transformative in every way. Its creation changed the fantasy world it exists within, and the real world it could not exist without. It's a story about power, those who claim it, and those who are to blame for losing it. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY for $5 off your order today. Getting older is dumb. For instance, I used to drink a whole bottle of soda right before bed and not even think twice about it. But now I gotta check the time to see if it's too late because sugar and caffeine keep me awake all night and I have to pretend to be an adult in the morning. Magic Spoon can help with problems like that. Not getting older, but feeling like you're getting older. If you're looking to cut out some of those carbs and sugar, trying to eat healthier, the cereal you ate when you actually were a kid might not be the right answer. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Also, only 140 calories. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb. I like fruit-flavored cereal, and Magic Spoon has me covered. But if you prefer something more chocolatey, go for cocoa. Something a little more toasty, get the cinnamon. Build your own variety pack from frosted peanut butter, maple waffle, and a whole bunch of other awesome flavors. They even drop limited edition flavors all the time and now ship to Canada and the UK. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Use my code TOYGALAXY for $5 off your delicious and healthy Magic Spoon cereal. Go to magicspoon.com slash toygalaxy to save $5 today. Thanks again to Magic Spoon. Since 1982, Masters of the Universe has unfolded as an incredible world with layers upon layers of stories to be told, generations of new adventures and revelations, of its development, of its creators, of the characters and related merchandise. For this video, we're focusing on the creation and legacy of the original He-Man and the Masters of the Universe animated series. That said, there are things we can't not mention, like the original toy line and the live action movie starring Dolph Lundgren. And there are things that we could but won't be talking about in this video, like 1985's She-Ra, Princess of Power, 1990's The New Adventures of He-Man, 2002's He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, 2018's She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, and both 2021 Netflix series Masters of the Universe Revelations and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. We're gonna break the whole thing into many faceable parts and give each series their own opportunity to shine in their own videos. Eventually. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is a 130-episode animated series spanning two seasons from September of 1983 to December of 1984. It spun off a sister series, saved Mattel from bankruptcy, and changed the way television entertainment and advertising was targeted at children. And the kids loved it. Eternia is a planet far away from here, across space and likely across time, at the center of its own universe. A world where magic and science coexist to create fantastic machines of progress and weapons of destruction. A world divided into two realms, one of light and the other of darkness. The light is governed by the royal family, King Randor, Queen Marlena, and their son, Prince Adam, with his giant pet tiger, Cringer, and magical friend, Orko, by his side. The darkness is ruled by the evil Skeletor, who commands his minions from Snake Mountain. Prince Adam has a secret, though. He carries the Sword of Power, which he can use to transform into He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe, and Cringer into Battle Cat. With the help of Duncan, the royal man-at-arms, and his daughter, Teela, the four heroes fight on behalf of the Sorceress to protect Castle Grayskull, a mighty fortress and the source of fabulous secret powers. Masters of the Universe is a brand created by Mattel, an American toy company founded in 1945. In 1959, Mattel introduced Barbie, the toy that would become the face of their brand. In 1960, they became a public company. And in 1968, they introduced Hot Wheels, shifting the market with farther reaching implications than they knew at the time. In 1969, Mattel sponsored a 30-minute Saturday morning cartoon called Hot Wheels, inspired by their line of toy cars called Hot Wheels. Competitors like Topper Toys, who sold the Johnny Lightning brand of toy cars, complained to the Federal Communications Commission that Mattel was getting 30 minutes of free advertising time. The issue for some toy producers was a desire for a level playing field among companies promoting their products to the kids watching the shows. The issue for some toy consumers was concern that kids couldn't tell the difference between the entertainment part of a television show and the advertising part. 
By 1977, the Federal Trade Commission was moving from limiting advertising time on children's television to banning it altogether. Child advocacy groups wanted shows that were entertaining, educational, and uninfluenced by sponsors believing that it wasn't healthy for children to be exposed to commercialism like that. As if. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan appointed Mark Fowler as chairman of the FCC, and together they began deregulating the entire marketplace of children's television and the advertising related to it, paving the way for cartoons to exist with the explicit purpose of advertising toys, and the YouTube shows that decades later would exhaustively analyze them. In 1975, Kenner, instead of creating a brand from scratch, licensed the rights to the popular TV series The Six Million Dollar Man. This was the first time an action figure line was licensed from a television show and furthermore, succeeded in and of itself. Prior to this, toy lines that were associated with a TV show or movie tended to lose interest and sales when the movie or show was no longer being aired. Before home video existed, before you could pick where and when you wanted to watch a show, out of sight meant out of mind, meant no sales. So it should come as no surprise that Mattel, when approached by an independent film studio called Lucasfilm in 1976, declined to purchase the rights to produce a Star Wars action figure line, not to mention the unrealistic delivery target of Christmas 1977. Regular viewers of this show know that Star Wars was a very popular film and Kenner made a lot of money on tiny plastic people in spaceships. The industry turned upside down and Mattel had to play catch up scrambling for the Battlestar Galacticas, the Flash Gordons, and the Mork and Mindys. Mattel resolved to develop their own property. Mark Ellis, Mattel's new marketing director, big fan of Frank Frazetta and Conan, helped kick off the process by doing market research because that is the most important part of developing a toy line. The first goal was to figure out what the kids respond to, specifically boys age 5 to 10 years old. Their research narrowed it down to space, army, and barbarian fantasy. Roger Sweet was a preliminary designer, the most important part of developing a new toy line. Roger wanted to develop a toy that stood out from competitors because it's bigger and stronger. Not with these spindly arms and legs, not with these passive faces and resigned postures. Roger Sweet, as he tells the story, imagined a powerful hero with rippling muscles, inspired by the artwork of Frank Frazetta and Conan. He took three of Mattel's big gym action figures and customized them to represent the potential action hero. One spacefaring, one armed to the military teeth, and one a barbarian warrior. Maybe it's all the same guy. Maybe it's different guys. He presented the idea to Mattel President Ray Wagner as He-Man, a name he says came to him in a moment of inspiration like a bolt of lightning after trying 40 or 50 other names prior to the presentation. The physical mock-up figures Roger Sweet created were supported by artwork from Mark Taylor, a product designer for Mattel, the most important part of developing a new toy line. Mark was a big fan of Frank Frazetta and spent his entire life doing drawings inspired by Conan, Tarzan, Prince Valiant, and John Carter of Mars. A lot of his time at Mattel was spent drawing things that may or may not become toys one day. Some of his drawings depicted barbarian heroes, skeletons and monsters, swords and sorcery and fantastic otherworldly landscapes. His characters, along with Ted Meyer's vehicles and Rudy Obrero's painted packaging art, established the foundation for the core characters and the tone for the rest of the line. Meanwhile, Mattel was approached by Conan Properties International, who were looking to get a toy line into production to correspond with the release of their movie, Conan the Barbarian, in 1982. Mattel obliged by developing a concept. However, before the film was released, Mattel was informed that the film was going to be rated R, a killer for a toy line aimed at 5 to 10 year olds. Mattel asked to be released from the obligation and understood that there would be a cost. They paid the fine and the matter was, for the moment, settled. Development continued on Masters of the Universe at the time called Lords of Power. Paul Cleveland was an engineer, the most important part of developing a new toy line. He determined the physical size of the action figure line as five and a half inches based on the cost of materials, the functionality, and the price point they were targeting. As director of marketing, Mark Ellis had one of the most important jobs in the development of this line. When he was asked by retailers how the story of He-Man would be told, he proposed the idea of mini comic books inserted into the packaging of the figures. Those initial stories and concepts one of the most important parts of the development of the toy line were written by Donald Glute and illustrated by Alfredo Alcala. The mini-comics put the characters into context, help flesh out the world and give some explanation to various artifacts and the good versus evil narrative. Eternia is a land ravaged by war. Fantastic machines litter the landscape as a jungle barbarian embraces the new power, weapons, and responsibility entrusted to him by the sorceress to defend Castle Grayskull against the evil Skeletor. A terrible creature who has arrived in this realm thanks to a dimensional rift created by the Great War. Skeletor wants to find both halves of the Power Sword to command the power of Castle Grayskull, which he will use to summon his people through the rift in space to conquer Eternia. We meet the other characters in the first few waves of figures and get a look at some of the vehicles and, of course, Castle Grayskull itself. 
Mini comics helped tell the story, but regular sized comics helped even more, spreading the mythology without the upfront commitment of a figure purchase. On top of that, a partnership with DC Comics allowed them to introduce He Man and his world with a spectacular battle against another very powerful beloved superhero. In July of 1982, DC Comics published DC Comics Presents number 47, featuring Superman and the Masters of the Universe, written by Paul Kupperberg with pencils by veteran Superman artist Kurt Swan. Readers would be shocked to find Superman magically transported to Eternia, mind controlled by Skeletor, forced to fight He-Man. That was followed by a bonus preview book inserted into 16 DC titles in November, the cover of that preview proclaiming that He-Man fights the mystic forces of the evil Skeletor with the timeless kingdom of Eternia itself at stake. A three-issue miniseries followed introducing several facets of the mythology for the first time, including the duality of He-Man and Prince Adam, as well as Cringer and Battle Cat, the royal family, and Queen Marlena's connection to Earth. The toys were first released in 1982. He-Man, Skeletor, Man-at-Arms, Beast-Man, Battle-Cat, Merman, Stratos, Tila, Zodak, weapons and accessories, vehicles, and Castle Grayskull itself. A whole new world of adventure and mystery at a whole new scale with new action features empowering imaginations around the world. Mattel was planning on sales in the range of $13 million. They nearly tripled it at $32 million, which attracted the attention of Conan Properties, who took Mattel to court, claiming that the idea was, essentially, stolen from them when Mattel had the license and failed to produce anything Conan-related. Now it seemed clear to them why. Hard to deny the similarities, not just between He-Man and Conan, but also between Skeletor and Thulsa Doom, and the fact that everybody who worked on Masters of the Universe was a professed fan of the characters and the series. That said, it didn't look like the movie. CPI claimed that Mattel acquired the Conan license to prevent anyone else from making Conan toys and to make sure that the fantasy barbarian market belonged to Mattel. Mattel assured them that they had been developing Masters of the Universe long before CPI even approached them about the license, and fortunately, the courts agreed. Come on, we haven't much time. We'll make it, we'll make it, He-Man. There he is, in that rock! Stand back. It's here, only at Burger King, a He-Man cup for your kids. Treat them to a different He-Man comic strip cup every week. Excellent. Four cups to collect and play with. To get one, just buy the Burger King meal pack. A hamburger, a cheeseburger, regular fries, and a soft drink. Come and get me. At Burger King! Mark Ellis, when presenting the line to retailers, was asked how kids as young as five years old were going to understand the story of He-Man. Yeah, it's great that there will be comics, but not all five-year-olds can read. Ellis replied that they were working on the most important part of the new line, a cartoon. The content of the show still had to fit U.S. television broadcast standards and practices, which meant that He-Man couldn't really use his sword to, like, murder and stuff. But thanks to the deregulation of advertising on children's television, there was no legal or market competition concerns about basing a cartoon on the toys like Hot Wheels back in the 60s. After a failed attempt to partner with Hanna-Barbera, Mattel found a collaborator in Filmation. Filmation had already produced a television commercial for Mattel late in 1982, featuring the core characters facing off at Castle Grayskull. Lou Scheimer, head of Filmation, big fan of Conan, loved the concept and agreed to do it if Filmation could have complete creative control. More than that, he loved the idea of keeping his animators employed on a show that was going to need 65 episodes to fill a 13-week schedule. Because Masters of the Universe wasn't going to be a Saturday morning cartoon, it was going to be syndicated. Scheimer helped build Saturday morning cartoons into what they were. In 1966, Filmation, along with Fred Silverman, produced The New Adventures of Superman, which broke up the routine of Saturday morning programming that was primarily reruns of existing animated shows like Tom and Jerry and The Jetsons. Superman was a licensed superhero at a time when superhero comics were experiencing a renaissance. Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, and the X-Men were all brand new comic book series, but Superman was still the most well-known thanks to the live-action TV series that ran from 1952 to 1958. Filmation and Mattel pitched Masters of the Universe to the major networks ABC, CBS, and NBC, but the networks declined. Daily syndication was the only choice left, a new approach to original cartoon programming, previously the exclusive domain of Saturday morning. An even deeper, more emotional connection to the audience was the result of Filmation investing in the mythology. In December of 1982, writer Michael Halperin, working for Filmation, had the most important job, developing the story bible. 
The line had grown out of visual concepts intending to create an engaging toy line, but the story changed with each new mini-comic, regular comic, or now cartoon. The Bible established a necessary, consistent history of the world, cataloged the characters and their powers, set a solid foundation. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe first aired in September of 1983, two seasons of 130 total episodes running through December of 1984. The theme song was composed by Shuki Levy and Saban. If you listen, you can still hear it in the wind. It starred John Irwin as He-Man, Ram Man, Faker, Webstore, and others. Alan Oppenheimer as Skeletor, Cringer, Battlecat, Man at Arms, Merman, and others. Linda Gary as Tila, Sorceress, and others. Lou Scheimer himself voiced Orko, King Randor, Manny Faces, Zodak, and again, a lot of others. It was written by talented television writers like Larry Dottilio, Paul Dini, Mark Scott Zacree, and, um... J. Michael Straczynski. Masters of the Universe aired five days a week, keeping kids engaged in the mythology and keeping Mattel at the forefront of their consumer needs. Masters of the Universe established a very successful template, changing the media landscape for kids and the products they wanted to own. Within a year, it was airing in over 30 countries and over 100 stations in the United States. In 1983, it helped push Mattel's Masters of the Universe sales past their goal of $65 million to $111 million. By December of 1984, the end of the second season, that number would push to nearly $500 million in sales. It was the most popular syndicated television program in the 2 to 11 bracket, with 30% of the audience being girls. Despite those numbers and the sales power it was flexing, it was not renewed for a third season. However, 130 episodes was more than enough to maintain its position in syndication for years to come. And Mattel was already beginning to expand the toy line to potentially appeal direct to that 30% of the audience that was young girls. Or maybe supplement the existing boys toys line with more female characters. I'm not sure who they were targeting and neither were they. In March of 1985, there was an official passing of the torch to He-Man's sister, She-Ra. A crossover film called He-Man and She-Ra, The Secret of the Sword introduced She-Ra, explained her previously unknown connection to He-Man and Eternia, and relocated the story to the world of Etheria. He-Man wasn't gone forever, though. He and some of the other cast members appeared in cameo roles on the new series. She-Ra, Princess of Power, began in September of 1985. In November, both characters met again in He-Man and She-Ra, a Christmas special. The two series frequently aired together in one-hour blocks of programming, a new episode of She-Ra with a rerun of He-Man. In fact, He-Man would continue to air its 130 episodes in syndication through 1988 and then for two more years on the USA Cable Network. The real power of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe that all the brands wanted to possess cannot be measured simply in the profits for Mattel or the ratings for the television series. It was the power to appeal to consumers at such a young age, across media, unfettered from regulations prohibiting exactly that method. Was it bad? Was it wrong? Depends on who you asked. Child and family advocacy groups saw He-Man and the Masters of the Universe as the worst case scenario for their decades of effort. They saw it as explicitly a daily 30 minute commercial designed to sell toys directly to kids with no other redeeming value. Frank Orm, then president of the National Association for Better Broadcasting, an advocacy group whose motto was probably, won't someone think of the children, stated very clearly that He-Man and the Masters of the Universe would not exist without the tie-in to Mattel. It is pure commercialism right straight through. The creators agreed in principle that it wouldn't have existed without the Mattel toy line to spur its creation, but disagreed with the idea that it was A, bad, and B, meant that it had inherently no entertainment or educational value. The creators of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe had gone through great effort to instill the core morality of He-Man into their production. He-Man was created to be power, to share that power with children. More than anything, that's what kids were attracted to with He-Man. The ability to role play some control over their world, over bedtimes, food selection, school attendance, the ability to override their tyrannical parents. He-Man is a good, caring person. He uses his power to help those in need, to fight against the forces of evil, no matter how ridiculous their schemes might be. Every episode closed with a recap of the moral message of that episode, themes of family and friendship, belonging, diversity, and inclusivity. He-Man's success on US television and in the toy aisle set the template for others to follow, and the entire market became a single, inescapable, blaring entity of daily televised 30-minute toy commercials for the next decade. G.I. Joe, GoBots, Transformers, Thundercats, My Little Pony, Rainbow, Bright, Voltron, Care Bears, Star Jason, Wheeled Warriors, Rambo, Star Bionic Six, Brave Star, Madball, Sky Commanders, Spiral Zone, Starcom, Tiger's Gem, Mask, Robotics, Defenders of the Earth, Ghostbusters, and Humanoids, Laser Tag Academy, Popples, Pound Puppy, Silverhawks, Chuck Norris, Karate, Kind of Shutters, Teddy Ruxpin, Visionaries, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Sky Shepherd, Strike Force, Cops, Dino Riders, Robocop, Police Academy, Captain, and Ring Raiders, and the Karate Kid. 
1986, sales fell. And in 1987, sales crashed. There is no single reason why Masters of the Universe sales dropped off so quickly. Despite Mattel's incredible short-term success with Masters of the Universe as a company, they were in a tight spot. In 1977, Mattel heavily invested in electronic handheld gaming. Successful at first, by 1983, Mattel posted nearly $400 million in losses. On the verge of declaring bankruptcy, they were bailed out by $230 million of venture capital in 1984. That changed a lot of decisions at the top. When Masters of the Universe began, there was a focus on keeping He-Man and Skeletor on the shelves for new buyers finding the line for the first time. Over the life of the line, that discipline had tapered off. An overstock of the background characters hurt. Squeeze isn't going to bring a lot of people into the line. They expect the high-tech toys to boost Christmas sales by 8% over last year. Yet sales are likely to remain flat for the year as a whole. The fall-off in sales of older lines was just too great. As a result, Standard & Poor's expects the biggest companies to show a ho-hum performance for 1986. Hasbro's expected to increase earnings by just three cents a share. Mattel is likely to see earnings drop by two-thirds, from a dollar to 35 cents a share. And Look, it's not fair, but the introduction of She-Ra changed the perception of the line. It didn't appeal to girls to the degree that He-Man had appealed to boys before it, and it didn't appeal to boys who were interested in getting toys that, for all intents and purposes, were designed for girls. Executives at Mattel made the decision to ship warehouses full of Masters of the Universe figures out to stores before their fiscal year closed out at the end of 1986 and 1987 so they could collect bonuses on the product they had moved. The value of the figures was declining as more and more stores marked down the overstock. Hasbro and other toy manufacturers had developed their own exciting toy lines and utilized the cross-media promotional tools Masters of the Universe had pioneered. After having been around for two or three years, kids were moving on to G.I. Joe, Transformers, Thundercats, Voltron, Jason the Wheeled Warriors, the Nintendo Entertainment System had leveled up home video gaming to a degree that was unimaginable to kids at the time. Gobbling up all those extra gift dollars, Nintendo's slogan was, Now you're playing with power, He-Man! They took your thing! The final Doug Flutie Hail Mary attempt to save the line when all the money was gone was to shift away from the cartoon to produce a live action movie with characters that were essentially unrecognizable to the kids who had grown up with it. No Battle Cat, no Orko, and it took place on Earth. Masters of the Universe was released in August of 1987, produced by Canon, directed by Gary Goddard, starring Dolph Lundgren fresh off his appearance as Yvonne Drago in Rocky IV. The record will show that shooting stopped several times because neither Mattel nor Canon had any more money to pay the people making it, and Goddard had to essentially make up an ending to shoot because they couldn't do what they wanted to do. The toys that were actually released to tie into the movie were Gwildor, Blade, and Sorod, not, you know, He-Man. Or Skeletor. Production designer William Stout explained that when Mattel came to get the designs for the characters, he told them that no one had paid him for action figure designs, so no, they couldn't have them. Just great decisioning all around by Mattel. And just a few months after He-Man was released in theaters, in October of 1987, the stock markets around the world crashed in what is now called Black Monday, Black Tuesday in New Zealand. Why and what were the implications for Mattel and He-Man? I couldn't possibly get into it here. That's a story for our new channel, Finance Galaxy. What I do know, what I can say, is that Masters of the Universe had accounted for 94% of all profit growth at Mattel during its time on the shelves. 1987 represented a 98% drop-off in sales for Masters of the Universe, and no brand can survive that. Masters of the Universe was an all-encompassing media strategy. DC Comics produced Masters of the Universe mini-comics through 1985. In 1986, Marvel picked up the rights for the first ongoing Masters of the Universe comic, 13 issues including an adaptation of the movie, under their kids' imprint Star Comics sitting on the shelf next to Heathcliff, Spider-Ham, and the Ewoks. The final issue was published in May of 1988. There was a monthly Masters of the Universe magazine, of which I still have several issues and a bunch of the insert posters. 16 issues from 1985 through 1988. A daily newspaper strip ran in syndication from 1985 to 1989 in the U.S. and papers around the world. Despite its struggle against the rising tide of home video gaming, He-Man and Friends appeared in their own titles. Masters of the Universe, The Power of He-Man, hit the Intellivision and Atari 2600 in 1983. Masters of the Universe, The Arcade Game, and Masters of the Universe, The Super Adventure made it to Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum in 1987. The Dolph Lundgren movie got an adaptation as well in 1987 for the Amstrad CPC, Commodore 64, and ZX Spectrum. FASA produced Masters of the Universe role-playing game in 1985 that could be supplemented with miniatures by Grenadier Models. Grenader models. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> That's a good take. <laughs>
Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> the animated series was released on VHS and Beta at various points from 1983 to 1986. BCI Eclipse put out a complete collection on DVD in 2005. Mill Creek Entertainment re-released the entire series on DVD in 2010. For the 30th anniversary of the Masters of the Universe brand in 2012, Mill Creek released a 22-disc set of all 130 episodes, 20 episodes of the 1990 New Adventure series, and all 39 episodes of the 2002 He-Man and the Masters of the Universe series. In 2019, Universal Pictures Home Entertainment once again released all 130 episodes on DVD. It also includes both He-Man and She-Ra animated films, The Secret of the Sword, and A Christmas Special. As of this video, the series is available to stream on Amazon Prime and YouTube. A new feature film has been talked about for a very long time. The most recent version that was gaining steam in 2019 had Noah Centino as a potential He-Man. In 2021, it was announced that Centino was no longer attached as he had moved on to Black Adam. And earlier this year, in January of 2022, Sony announced that Kyle Allen was the new He-Man and that the project was heading to Netflix instead of theaters, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Potentially the best home for it after the success of both Masters of the Universe animated series. Production is set to begin sometime this summer. There is currently no announced release date. Masters of the Universe was responsible for over a billion dollars in sales rocket-powered by the animated series. It was single-handedly responsible for the creation of a generation of toys, cartoon, comics, and pop culture that today is still thriving. For better or for worse, we are living in a future determined by Masters of the Universe. I've made a huge mistake. 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 You've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. 40 years later, we can look back on it and see the positive and negative ripples that have flowed throughout pop culture, an historic legacy that several people claim to have been personally responsible for. The truth is that it could not have been created by a single individual. It was the kind of brand and power that could only have come from a collective, talented individuals doing their best work, professionals helping their teams excel, masters of their universe. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Check us out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy if you're in the position to help the channel grow. If you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below who your favorite He-Man guy is. I say guy because that's what my mom called action figures when I was a kid. If we were going out somewhere, she would say, hey, do you want to grab a guy to play with? And I would say yes and grab either Boba Fett or Snake Eyes. <laughs> on the rare occasion that I grabbed a He-Man guy, it was Roboto. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> <Cut>. <laughs>